I want to I want to put down something and then I want us to take a look at that and then I want to present something now what I'm telling you you know absolutely nothing about what I'm going to do except that I'm going to do something what I'm going to put down are some relationships among things I wonder if you've been interested as I have been in how come I see this and not that in any in any uh, place where I am or how come I see that and not this? And how come you see that and not this? When everything is there to be seen. I don't know if you've ever had uh, uh, participated in this little game. You uh, ask people to go around a room in, let's say, in two minutes, and then just be aware of what they saw. And you've got, let's say, 20 people, and so then you ask, what did you see? And the interesting thing is that people will come up with many different things that they saw. No one will come up with everything that's in the room. Very few people will come up with saying that they saw the same things. Now for me, that's a very important thing to remember. And that is I have told myself and follow this, that what I see at a moment in time is only what I see. It has nothing to do with what's present. It's only what I saw. Now, why do I pick something and uh, not something else? because that is inside myself, what I'm prepared to see. You know, in psychology, there was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, this is very much related. I see what I'm prepared to see. Now, how do I figure out what I'm prepared to see? What I'm prepared to see usually comes from my experience, both negative and positive. <clears throat> For instance, if I've been prepared not to see something and told, now you must never look at that, that's gonna be the first thing I'm gonna see. Have you noticed that? Just as if I am told this is what you must look at. So that what I'm prepared to see at any moment in time is a function of what I have been asked to pay attention to by people whom I have allowed to tell me what to do. Either allowed or felt that I had to. So that for me, what's so important is the relationship of what I see about something and what's really there has very little in common. I wonder if any of you have had the experience of having somebody report an incident among two people. And one story comes out like that and another one story comes out like that and it's supposed to be about the same thing. Have you noticed that? Then what happens is that people want to argue about who's right. And I don't know if any of you have ever gotten into that one about, about who's right. I, I cut the argument immediately and I say, you're both right. You're both right and neither of you have seen the total. I'll show you some things that I see that you haven't seen. So then what we do is we stop the business about who's right and we go to the exploring of what's there. Okay. So. That led me, in many, many instances like this, led me to the following. That, first of all, I perceive something. I have a perception. Out of all the reality that is there, I pick out something, which has to do with what I've learned to look for, etc. Now, that perception immediately has to be translated into meaning. What does it mean? And the meaning has two parts to it. What is the intellectual meaning and what is the emotional meaning? So, the intellectual meaning and the emotional meaning. Now then, as soon as I do that, I immediately have to do something else. I have to relate that to myself and my self-worth, my safety, my joy, whatever it is. So I have to relate it to myself. And it's related to the esteem part of myself. Okay? Now then, what I have to do, the next part of it is, is that when I do that, I begin to get emotional responses. So that's the next part of that, emotional responses. I'm safe. I feel ridiculous, I, um, whatever it is. Now, as soon as that happens, then I have to go to the ways in which I deal with myself when I feel that I have um, 
that in some way I have felt attacked. And so I go to my defenses. All right? Now then, once I go to my defenses, it's like saying, and I'll give you a little illustration here, then what I, have, what I am doing is I have stopped doing anything now except trying to be safe. However, there's another piece that runs through there, and that is what freedoms I give myself to comment on, the freedom to comment on what's going on, okay? Now, many of you know that there are conscious, um, conscious constraints. Like if somebody's been brought up to say they should never be angry, they have conscious constraints about saying that they're angry. That doesn't stop them from feeling that way. That's what I'm talking about as a freedom to comment. There is not a freedom to comment on that. Now, what comes out is a piece of behavior. All right. Now, what I'm putting in the box is all that people will see, the piece of behavior. All these other factors, and I'll number them. One, the perception. Two, the meaning, and that's got two parts. Three, the relationship to the self. Four, the emotional response. Five, the defense against it. Six, the freedoms to comment. And so what we see, there have been six operations that go into that behavior. That's seven, right there. Okay. <clears throat> now, what I found over the years, if I want to understand anybody's behavior, what I need to do is start out with, what did you see and hear? That's my question. What did you see and hear? Okay, and immediately with that, I know that that's taken out of the total of what there is. Then the next question is, what kind of sense did that make to you? What kind of meaning did that make to you? How did you feel as you saw or heard this? That's the emotional meaning and the intellectual meaning. Because we have two parts to our brain. We have the cognitive part and we have the sensing part, often referred to as the intuitive part. We have to make sense and feeling about everything. Okay. Then having the, the, the third question is, how do you feel in yourself? How do you feel about yourself? Feeling that way. See, the self-worth feeling is not in the feeling. It's the feeling about the feeling. So if you tell me you felt angry, that's just a state of affairs. But when I say to you, how do you feel about feeling angry, and you tell me guilty, that's the self-esteem hooker. But if you are feeling angry, and I say, how do you feel about feeling angry, you say, fine, because it fits. Your self-esteem is high, and there's nothing to get in the way. So many people don't know that <clears throat> a feeling doesn't tell you anything, but it's the feeling about the feeling that tells you whether or not it's an okay feeling. All right, now then. Now the emotional responses that go to that. And these are usually rooted in the past. And the emotional responses, <clears throat> for instance, if I feel guilty about feeling angry, <clears throat> which is what I did when you picked up that silverware on the table in front of my Aunt Minnie. You, my child, did that. And my Aunt Minnie is somebody who takes pride in how you handle your silverware. So I'm feeling angry and ashamed. All right, so my emotional <clears throat> response to feeling angry and ashamed is to get very tight and remote, okay? Now, my defense, that's a condition. The defense that I used at that point in time could be that I privately <clears throat> see you as someone who gets in my way, and you might be a child. In other words, the defense, the way I use the defense, or the defense I use, is to project it outside. It's because of you that I feel this way. Okay? Now then, but then I have rules about commenting which say to me that I cannot say anything about what I'm doing because I'm a nice person and I shouldn't have these awful feelings toward you and I shouldn't have them in myself. So I hold all that in. Result, 
uh, let us say that the, the event that uh, got stirred was this little child picked up the wrong piece of silver. The behavior, let us say, of the mother at that point in time was to move over to that child and tell her to leave the table immediately. Okay, so we are all in the position of seeing behavior, the murderous impulse, the not being able to fulfill and to do things on your exam the way you would like to, the way in which you fall down all the time. These are all behaviors. Now, this, these, these, all of this that I've mentioned to you are all what are going on and when and that will tell me and, exper and help me to understand the behavior. And I have looked at all of these and I have whole sets of ways of looking at all of these and putting them together so that for me any piece of behavior is the absolute, um, let me see how I put it, um, whatever people are doing absolutely fits how they perceive the world, kind of meaning that they make to it, the way they relate it to their self-esteem, the re emotional responses they make to it, the defenses they have, and their prohibitions against commenting. It absolutely fits. So this is why, if I want to change behavior, I don't work on the behavior. I see the behavior is telling me about these kinds of things. So what I get to do is I help people to perceive more clearly. For instance, I'll give you a little perception exercise. Uh, I take an opaque, this is not opaque, this is clear. I take, a, let us say, an opaque uh, glass or a cup, and I put liquid in it to about the, this part here, okay? Then I set that on a chair, let us say, a chair that's 30 inches high. I put somebody on the floor to look up at this. I get somebody to stand on a chair and look down on it. I have somebody to stand on the side, one side, that's up a little higher, and another side is down a little lower, and I ask each one of them to tell me what they see. All right, everybody will tell me what they see, and it will be in relation to where they are, their position, which is the same as this is, this is what, how I see the world. All right, then I say to them, all right, now, who's right? Who's right? This usually goes with the people who are giving me lots of trouble about who's right. And so I just, I just put this out, all right. Then what I do is uh, they will say, well, um, they might at the beginning if they're feisty enough, uh, they, will do, they will start this. And I say, all right, I'll stop it. Now I change the places where each person is. And <clears throat> so the one who was down on the floor looking up who couldn't see the liquid, could only see the bottom. The one was on the top that could see the liquid and couldn't see the bottom. I have them all change places. Now I say, what do you see? And I have them change places as many times as there are places. So, I, so then, it's very interesting. I never in that family again ever have to argue who's right. Do you know how long it would take me to get them over that if I tried to do it with words? So where do you come from at a moment in time? Wherever you come from is absolutely um, fits with what you see. So that's just an illustration of what I do. I try to make all kinds of homely, ordinary things to get people over the thing that what I see is all that there's there to see. And the way I see it is the only way it can be seen. So I don't, uh, I don't spend much time trying to convince people. I give them experiences that will move in. They're global, universal experiences that will move inside to help them. So now, when we've, well, for instance, when this has been clearly worked out, then a person will say, not this is how I saw it and this is what's right. They'll say, my picture of it is. This is the piece that I saw. And now we're ready to weave it together. And I think if there's one thing that therapists have to deal with, it's a question about who's right. So I dismiss that immediately and say, everybody's right. And if you think that's crack-brained, I'll show you what it's about. And you must also know something else. 
that the question about who's right carries with it who's loved. This is an old sibling thing in our families. And so we went to mama or to papa when we had trouble with our siblings or they saw we were having trouble and they decided who was guilty. And who was guilty was often felt the rejected one. So one of the things that I do, I've worked out many, many things to get the, what I call the universal intelligence inside of a person to begin to work. And I have many things like that. All right, so anyway, so the perception. So when people can talk about their reality, this is my picture at this point in time. This is a piece that I have. Good, we got it here. Now what's your piece and what's your piece? Then I can piece it all together. Then we can kind of see what happened. Instead of putting all the energy on who's right and who is bringing who to whose side. So I just stop it. I don't play with that. Absolutely do not play with it. If I get a husband and wife are quarreling, I stand between them. <laughs> Say, okay, now you tell me and then we'll see what happens. I'm right between you. I usually put them in a posture and then I stand there. And they can tell me, and then when I feel the coast is clear enough, I say, tell each other. Anyway, I do try to get to people's universal intelligence through the wisdom box. And these are almost all homely things. There's no professional language that helps you get to your wisdom box, as I can tell. All right, now, let's look at something else here. Human beings are made in such a way so that anything that happens, we have two parts of our brain that have to make meaning out of it. There is no way we do not. Question is, is it going to make sense or nonsense? Because we will make meaning. Everything that a human being does has to make meaning, be made into meaning by that human being. Somebody raises their hand and somebody sees that, they have to make meaning of it. I, that person has to go to the toilet, they say or that person wants to rest their arm. They've been down this far, so they're gonna give them this experience. Or somebody wants to be, uh, have attention called to them. We make meaning out of everything. And once we make intellectual meaning, there is always emotional meaning. I'll show you, somebody puts their hand up in a group. Somebody sees that and says to themselves, that person wants the attention of the teacher. And that person fully the further then can say to themselves emotionally, I couldn't do that. That person is better than me. And have a downer in their self-esteem from that. So the story for everyone, there is a story for everyone, what meaning they're making of it. I had a family one time where the father would he, w he had a pipe that he had, and some of his teeth were worn down from that pipe. Well, and every once in a while the teeth, somehow he clicked with his teeth on that pipe. And I noticed that every time the teeth clicked, there were two boys in the room, two sons, and one of them would get jittery. And the other one would move closer to his father. And so I was very curious about all this. The boy who started to get nervous when I checked this all out with him was, um, was uh, told me that his grandfather had told him that this is the way he lost his teeth. And so when, this, when he heard the clicking of his father, this boy's grandfather's words came to him and he was visualizing his father as being without his teeth. The one who went close to him didn't have that problem because he never heard his grandfather talk and nobody apparently passed that on to him. So the one who went close to him, he always heard this little clicking as a, like a little come on and that daddy, daddy would have some time for him. Now, you see, if I were to say to you, what does it mean when somebody has a pipe in their mouth and they click their teeth? Is there a universal answer to that? There's not a universal answer to anything. There's a process answer, but not a universal ta a cognitive answer. So that was fine. A wife in that case, she, she said it interfered with a kissing and she'd stop kissing him, but that was something else again. <laughs> so we had to reshape that. All right, always meaning is made. Question is, what is it? And there's been a tendency among therapists to think they know what it's about. 
if that happens. We have engaged in a CIA game. If this is going on over here, then, and this is what I see, then that must be what's going on over there without checking it out. Now I want to give you a checkout way. This is what I see. I notice at this moment in time your teeth are chattering. They're going like that. What I make of it, this is a therapist talking, what I make of that is that you're cold. Is that true? Many of us forget to ask that. Or I notice that your teeth, your, their teeth are chattering. Tell me, what are you feeling inside? What's happening for you? But a lot of people see the teeth chattering and assume that they're cold and then run for a sweater. That may or may not be true. So there is so much checking that needs to be done because one of the things we need to do is to remember that the behavior doesn't tell us anything definitive at all. Doesn't tell us anything definitive. It needs to be checked out. Your teeth can chatter for lots of reasons, only one of which is because people are cold. All right, now let's go to the self-esteem. There is no time at which human beings are not on some level of themselves conscious of their feeling of worth in the world. Am I rejected? Am I accepted? Now, a lot of times we play a lot of games with ourselves, especially when we haven't ever been sure that our self-worth is assured. And so we try to behave as though that's not a piece of it. And, and we put it on to something else, like good grades or I don't know what. However, underneath, underneath all of us is the question, does this mean that I'm of value? Does it not mean I'm of value? The closer we get to deciding our own values, the less we ask those questions. But the more that people get into behaviors that are destructive to them, the more they've been asking themselves the questions about everything. Does this mean I'm loved? Does it mean I'm not loved? And every therapist that I've ever encountered knows instinctively that the problems that the people in front of them have to do basically with a feeling that the person does not feel they're of worth. Anything could happen which would make them feel like they're nothing. If someone doesn't listen, that means that they're no good. Or someone says no to them and it means they're unloved. So what, what we're dealing with is the awareness that that a person's self-worth is a tenuous thing if it hasn't really been really evolved. And so people try to handle that by all of these games on the outside. So the self-worth then, and I know, I absolutely know if the behavior is destructive that the self-worth is tenuous. I know that. I absolutely know that. I don't even have to go find out, but I always do find out. Because there is no one with high self-worth who can develop and engage in destructive behavior. It just doesn't happen. The other way around. Pardon me? The other way around. People could be doing good things and still not have good things. Right, absolutely. Sure they could. The doing of good things is not the same as feeling good about yourself. I know people, lots of them, that do all kinds of good things out in the world and beat hell out of their kids at home. Do you, have you ever noticed that? So doing good works is not the same as feeling good about yourself. And we have this funny business that if people do good works and naturally, they must feel good about themselves. It doesn't so at all. It's nice that people do good works, but let us not, let us not confuse that with feeling good about ourselves. A lot of people who do good works do feel good about themselves, but it's then manifest in their whole lives. But we have put a big premium on doing good works, so much so that it'll, I'll do it if it kills me. Yes? Virginia, would you say the same thing is true in uh, mass movements like, uh, like Hitler's Germany? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's another thing we have to watch out for. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we, we did it. We went down a path, a very sad path, but I think we had to go on that path that was distinguishing, that did not distinguish between good works and feeling good. Because remember something, we are very young as human beings to think about the worth of a human being. Today, human life isn't worth much in many parts of the world. It is not worth much. Think also about the fact that we, in 1900, 
Women didn't have the vote. Women couldn't own anything. Women and children were chattel. That children, being chattel, were sent about into factories and age four were into coal mines, drawing the donkeys and things of that sort, and into the sweat houses, sweatshops. All right, that's only 84 years ago. And in that time, we have come slowly to something that is beginning to approximate that human life is of value. We haven't been very far. This is very young. In one sense, we've come a great distance in these 84 years. But we haven't really yet internally looked at what we do to see what does this say about worth of an individual? What does it say about my worth? What does it say about your worth? We couldn't do all the punitive things we do if we understood that these punitive things are harmful to a self-worth. And that when self-worth is harmed or not developed, it produces negative energy. And most much of the world is busy trying to change the behavior and not changing what's underneath. But we're in the process of evolving, and we're in a very important process of evolving. So I wouldn't want anybody to think that we had finished anything, because we haven't. We've come a long way. But just look what's happening still in minorities and all of the tortures that are going on all over the world and the senseless wars that are going on. It's, um, you know, we haven't come very far about human worth. But we're doing something about it at this point. All right, now let's look at emotional response. Whatever happens, human beings are equipped to respond. There's a physiological response. If you put yourself on a machine and whatever happens, you will get at least five readings for everything. An EKG, a GSR, an EEG, respiration, and one other thing I forgot at the moment. You'll get it. Everything, the body is responding because we are alive. However, the response may not be in awareness. You can, we, did, we took some people on machines about 20 years ago when I first developed these stances. And I'd have somebody blaming and placating and we had these five measurements behind. And we watched to see what happened. And uh, things changed like that. All these readings changed. So <clears throat> we are always responding, but the awareness of the response may not be there. And all therapists, I think, know that when people have blocks, it isn't that they haven't got a response. They've got a rule against a response that they shouldn't make. And all of these things that have to do with phobias and aphasias and all these kinds of things are, are based upon strong rules that have survival value that try to protect the owner from the pain of knowing. It's what the whole hypnosis thing, Erickson tried to get in, is to help people to get in touch with what it was they were trying to protect themselves against. And in the, in the, uh, in the protection, the way in which people protected themselves, they also lost other ways of trying to deal with things. We are not without our emotional response. That doesn't mean that it's available to us in our consciousness. When you, when you move into people like uh, in a catatonic state, they're feeling everything. It's re registering. They can't say it. I don't know if you know that. But the human body is always registering feeling. The fact that it is not there to be, uh, to be articulated doesn't mean it isn't there. So this is something important to remember. All right, now defenses. We're getting into the protection. That's what a defense is for, is to protect ourselves. Now, when a defense protects ourselves so well that we can't live, then the defense helps us, but it helps us to not get whatever it is, but we die in the process. The defense about, I'm not going to trust anybody because everybody is a threat to me. All right? That defense is aimed at trying to protect the self, but in that kind of protection, the self loses what it wants. 
All the psychological defenses that we know about are ways to protect, and every one of them has such a high price to it that it, we end up below zero most of the time. Like the defense, it isn't me, it's you. Projection. So what happens then? I have to do things because you're responsible for what my fate, then I can end up in the extreme of killing you because you're responsible for how badly I am, bad I am. Anyway, all right. Now, in the interest of survival, almost all of us have been taught there are certain things we should not allow ourselves to say. Furthermore, we shouldn't even allow ourselves to feel. And one of the biggest ones is to be angry at somebody you're supposed to love. So many of us have taught ourselves to not put words to that, keep it to ourselves. And of course, in the extreme, these are the, quote, good ones who murder their families one morning, as you know that, because it is not a healthy, a healthy situation for the self to behave as though there are no angry feelings. All right, so this connection then, here's the behavior. Here's the behavior. We can write books about behavior. We can call it all kinds of names. When we come to change it, change this destructive behavior, and behaviors can only go two directions, toward the self or toward the outside. If you kill somebody, that's a behavior directed to the outside. If you kill yourself, that's a behavior directed to the inside. And society says, and other people say, there are certain things you must not do. You can't go out there and kill people, and you're not supposed to kill yourself, as an example. So when certain behaviors happen, we say, society, whatever that is, you can't do this. And then we have something called rehabilitation, which is supposed to be to take that behavior on the part of that person and try to help that person to do differently, except that's not usually what we say. What we say is we want to stop this behavior. I spend no time in stopping behavior. I say, that's a skill you got. Now let's see if we can have some other ones. I remember a man and his wife and family were there, and this, there, there was a, a mother-in-law, the wife's mother. And this guy, and these were short-fused people. And he said, I'm going to kill her, his mother-in-law. She was, she was quite handy at pointing out all things that were wrong. And so I said to him, you know, tell me, how do you plan to do it? Well, he hadn't thought too much, but he had often thought about shooting her. And I said, that is a way to stop her nagging. Absolutely. <laughs> it's an expensive way to stop her nagging. But let us remember that that's one way. That's the best you thought of right now. Let's think of at least two other ways now where we can stop the nagging or where you can deal differently with it. And by the way, there's magic in the three alternatives. If you don't use your energy trying to get somebody to stop something and instead get your energy to find new possibilities, then a person is in a position of choice. And in a position of choice, you never feel pressed. You never feel pressed. I've had people in an audience, when I, when I was demonstrating something like this with a family, and somebody said they wanted to do somebody in, and I said, well, that's one way. I think you will accomplish your goal, but I don't know what else will happen. And people would say, why, why didn't you tell them they couldn't do that? I said, that's ridiculous. Whoever stopped anything because you told them they couldn't do it. <coughs> but if the only thing you got to deal with something, if you only got one thing, then that's what you're going to use. That's the way it is, isn't it? So I help people to get different ways. We role play and all kinds of other stuff like that. So, anyhow, yes, the be uh, all right, we're going to have a change in, a, in, a, in the change. that is an educational one. Which Pardon me? Which is insightful. Yeah. Well, there's outside and insight. There you go. 
And that's the way I like to look at it. And we all have better outsight than insight. Okay? <coughs> All right. Did you have your hand up? OK. All right, so you see how rich I feel whenever I'm confronted with a piece of behavior and somebody says they want to change, because I know I can help them. I know that any destructive behavior has diminished perception of what's present. I know that the meaning is very skimpy and usually um, very stilted. I know that the person is constantly feeling in danger of not being loved, and their emotional responses are there of always fear, and that their defenses are how to feel that they aren't afraid, put something out there in control, and they're full of the inability to comment. That's what I know. It doesn't matter what symptom category, it all applies, it would be just different. So I can feel rich. That's why I can go anywhere with anybody and help them out. And you will notice this has nothing to do with what I want people to do, but it has to do with the process of human beings, how we are. All right. Now there's another piece I want to give us, and let's take a look. And that is that we've been working so long, all of us, in our, in our uh, therapeutic roles, to go from pathology we meet people at the level of pathology. That's what we've been doing. Whatever we do it, O L O G Y, I guess is right here. And what we're supposed to do is bring to function somehow. That's been the traditional role of the therapist. Here's somebody with pathology, and what we're supposed to do is use our skills to bring them to function and hope that they can reasonably function in a society where they are. And that was going on for a very long time. However, for me at this moment in time, I'm not satisfied with bringing people to function. I want them to come to a state of joy and a state of creativity. So for me, to come to joy and creativity and where life has some meaning, not just adjustment. So I can still start with the behavior that people are showing me and the way I deal with that to bring them to joy and to creativity is inherent in what I was talking to you about. I am not just interested in people stopping what they're doing because I know this world needs all of our creative positive energy. We have many serious things to work with. So that means this is a health oriented view where a symptom is looked upon, for me anyway, as something very important. Because how would we know that anybody was stuck if they didn't have a way of showing it? I remember a family in which there was a boy. This was a prominent family in one of the large cities of the United States. And a young man, very gifted young man, an artist who was suffering from what people called schizophrenia. And after a nine month period of treatment with him and his father and mother and his older sister, at the end of the treatment, the father put his hand on his son's shoulder and said, thank you, son, for getting sick so we could get well. And beautiful kind of thing happened. But I dealt with that, using what that behavior was to tell me that something was stuck in growth and that we could go on. So this is a health-oriented view which will bring us there. Because I believe that human beings are, were made for joy, not made for pain that we have enough pain, and there's a lot of pain we have to get through to go to joy. And I didn't realize for a long time, certainly in the early days of my, life, of my career, that bringing people to function usually meant who's in whose way, whose way. But so here's where I am in this point in time. And what's so interesting, for me anyway, that when I have, as I have this point of view, and I see that people are using the best that they know, and it's called pathology or problem, they're telling me what they've learned. So now I can go back to what I had on the board here before and extend all of these things, all of these pieces, and we can come to joy. That beautiful Gloria this morning. Where is Gloria? 
Yeah, Gloria, when we're talking about something, that she's giving herself permission to live a life of joy rather than of being put into little pigeonholes. Didn't you get that impression? Isn't that what the permissions are about? Anyway, and I'm not the only one who talks this way, but I'm one of the ones who is mouthy about it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right. You know, Hans Selye, who is the, was a physician in Canada, worked on stress all his life. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him when he was quite old, and, but I still had the pleasure of meeting him. In his writing, he said, probably one of the difficulties with people is that they never expect to be joyful. They only expect to be just a little bit sick. And so therefore, they're in a constant state of stress. And I believe that's true. Whatever it is that I expect, that's what I get. And, you know, uh, there are many of us in this country and other countries that were brought up on the idea that man was born in sin. <coughs> I think it was a horrible thing to foist upon people, horrible. But, and then you had to spend all your time, all your life to keep that, either get rid of that sin or to watch that it didn't come again. So we were so busy with all that that we never found the joy. There was a cult group in California last year that was discovered that epitomized this. Man is born in sin, so they wanted to have their children to be, to be okay. So they started beating them at age 18 months. And a family came out of there with their beaten children and said they could no longer stand the cries of these little children who were beaten. So, and, and, yet, and I thought about that, and I thought how horrible that is, and yet at the same time, I'm also aware that the way in which we, we try to teach by punishment, I don't know how many of you had trouble going gra through graduate school, but if that wasn't a set of punishments, I'll eat my shirt. <laughs> and there was, there's still that kind of thing that you learn well when you're punished, which I think is just horrible. Anyway, so we have, we have um, the, the idea, and, and that has been underneath a lot of stuff, that we're really awful bad, and that if we aren't careful, all the awful stuff will fall out. Well, I cannot buy that. I cannot buy that. I cannot look at an infant and say, that kid is full of sin. Just cannot. And I don't. And it is unarguable with me. I don't even bother about trying to change people's minds. All right, because I don't believe that for one minute. I believe we were made to flower. And the problem that we don't flower is because of what we've told ourselves we can and cannot do. And that's the real problem. And that's what we're merging out of this darkness into some light at this point in time. <clears throat> All right. Can I share something with you? Sure. Uh, you want to come up here, love? Come. Yeah. We don't want any words to not be heard by everybody. Okay. When I, w it's the darkness and the light and the flowering. I had a little garden and there wasn't very much light and I went to this little nursery that this man had. It was in, Delaware, and he had this beautiful plant with these lovely yellow flowers on it, and I said to him, he knew the little garden I had, and I said, could I get that and put it in my garden? And he looked at me as if I was really stupid, and he said, well, it won't flower, and I didn't want to hear that. And he said, don't you know, it takes the sun to set a bud, and it, it it's what the picture that came into my mind when you talked about coming out of the darkness. If there's the darkness, then you won't get the bud. And I just remember the old man in Delaware, and I didn't take it home because the garden was too dark. But we take the kids home and put them in dark gardens and then wonder where the buds are. <laughs> That's a lovely metaphor. Don't you think so? All right, now. See, all of this, in a way, is a kind of preface to some things. But I found that if people don't have an opportunity to understand some things, 
like all of those things I was putting on the board before about perception, etc. Then when we come to the doing, it becomes a robot response instead of something that is really an awareness response, okay? Now I mentioned that for many people, life is a bleak thing. I remember when we were, when I was much younger and I would attend some of the psychoanalytic things, I would hear that this kid, of course, would be doing this because the kid didn't want to grow up. Um, how would a child know that they didn't want to grow up? They would hear it about how horrible it was growing up from the people that were around them. And there are a lot of people who complain about how hard growing up is and how hard being an adult is. Did any of you ever complain about that? Okay. We'd like to have it different. Part of the reason we can't have it different yet, or don't, is because of the views we continue to carry. And I would not stand up here before you and say that I think that's an easily accomplishable thing, but it's more accomplishable than what we've ever thought. Now, <clears throat> I want now to present something to you that puts into a perspective way of viewing. I do believe that we are making an evolutionary leap at this point in time that there is a world that is moving so fast in directions that wouldn't have been thought of 50 years ago. And that things are happening now that couldn't have been dreamed of for a long time. So I worked out something, I call it ways of perceiving the world, because I find that if I can help people to see and they can feel that inside as some kind of a universal thing, that it's like, oh yes, I do know that, but I had forgotten that I know it. And all of us here, who most of us make our living by trying to help people, it's very important, it seems to me, that we also use ourselves in a way that is going to be the most helpful that we can. <clears throat> now, after years and years of watching people and being connected with people all over the world, I noticed that there were four, uh, four phenomena that if I understood how people perceived them, how they lived them, what their pictures were and their images, I could understand very quickly how their behave, why their behavior was as it was. The first one had to do with a definition of a relationship or a pair. How do people define relationship and pairing? The second one had to do with the definition of a person. Who is a person? The, fourth one, the third one had to do with how we explain events, the why of something. And the fourth one had to do with the attitude toward change. You know, after you see so many things, there are certain things that jump out at you. If you're writing notes, please write this on a page and put this in the middle. Otherwise, it won't make that much sense to you. <clears throat> what I said, first of all, these are neutral. We have to have... They're neutral phenomena. We always have a relationship. There's no way we cannot have one. We're all persons. And things happen, events happen, and change takes place. I mean, these are all neutral kinds of things that, we, that goes on every single day and are very basic to what goes on with people. All right. What I said about this is if I understand how a person sees, experiences, defines, and lives each one of these things, then I understand their behavior, too. All right. I've given a name, I've given a name to some ways of viewing this. And this side is called threat and reward. And this side is called seed. I just made up those names. Nothing sacred in a name. All you need to know is what it means. Okay? Now, <clears throat> what's been in vogue for a very long time is that in pairing, somebody is on the top and somebody is on the bottom, which I've given the name hierarchical to. And it's based on power and role. It has nothing to do with persons. 
Now I want to show you something. We probably will get this, well, we'll get a little bit farther before lunchtime. I like to have three men and three women, please, to come up here. I want to show you something. One woman, need two more. One man, need another man. Two women, another, another woman, got three. Now I need two more men who will come. Thank you, and another man, one more. Never lost anybody with this one, fine, perfect. All right, now, tell you what. Let's see, it's gonna be too hard to do this on here because there's not enough room. You two gals, would you be right here, let's see. You know, and if you need to uh, see better, why don't you move over somewhere, okay? Because I, I would hope those chairs are all, let me just have you like this. I'm choreographing, so you won't, don't know what I'm doing here, okay? Now, would you two get together right here, like that? And you two get together right over here, come over here. Here, right, like that. All right, okay. Now, <clears throat> what you see up here are the only possible kinds of pairs there can be. A pair can exist with only, only two possibilities. If you're female, you can be with another female, or with a male, that's all there is. There isn't anything else. If you're a male, you can be with another male or a female. That's all there is, there isn't anything else. And the universe of pairs are only three. This is all. All. Nothing else. Now, what makes us think that there's so many variations of that is because of the names we give. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this now in a family. Here are two sisters, two brothers, <coughs> A husband and wife, and if they're kids, we'll also add a father and mother. Those are familiar. But now let's look at it another way. Here is a mother and a daughter. Here's a mother and a son. There's a father and a son. A father and a daughter, grandfather and grandson, aunt and niece. Mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. We have all these different names for pairing. Friends. Um, colleagues, this is the president of the organization and that's the secretary. And over here is, <laughs> is the president of the board and the uh, superintendent of the schools. Uh, the foreman in the factory and one of the workers. We have names. What we've done has been to give to the pairing the power that exists out of the role in the pairing. Chances are pretty good if you ask somebody what they do, they will give you, they will not talk about themselves in any way at all. They will act as though their identity comes from doctoring or nursing or social working or I don't know what, okay? okay. You don't get an identity from a word. All right. Now, since power is the biggest piece of all this, because everything that I have talked about, all the labels that I've given, there's an implication in those labels about who's on top. I will start out with an age-old one. We'll make this a, a heterosexual pair. This is true, homosexual, lesbian, doesn't matter, because pairing all has the same requirements if you go at it from the standpoint of power and role. Okay, so we'll do, I'll show you what's been in vogue for a long time. Would you stand up? Like so, and will you get at his feet, please? <laughs> like that. All right. Be comfortable on your feet because you're gonna be here for a while. Now, <clears throat> this is a picture of a heterosexual pair. It's been in vogue for a very long time, okay? Now, that also can be the picture of a child and a father, okay? That's the picture of a student and a teacher, of a parishioner and a priest. Now, what I want us to cl get clear about is how much in our society the, the power business works in this, and how easy it is for this one down here to buy the fact that I'm little, not worth very much, somebody else is worth more than me. 
so clear. All of us, as I said, were born as children. And depending upon what the adults around us knew how to do to help us get to our feet was the outcome of us to be on our feet. And many of us didn't get to our feet at that time. We've had, we have to do it now. All right. Now, <clears throat> this position of one down and the other up, would you, one of you, get down and the other up? Same one over here, one down and one up. In front of your, in front of your partner here. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the pairing in relation to the following. Let's make this the worship one. Would you kindly worship, please? Put your hands together and worship. No, not you. You're the one being worshipped. <laughs> and you will look up straight ahead, okay? You're the one. You're giving her a pat on the head. And you're giving him the finger. No, not you. <laughs> not that. Not that. This kind of a finger. The bony finger. All right. <laughs> See, what's interesting about this is when I, and I do this rather deliberately, when somebody gives you the finger like that, a lot of people want to do that. But they don't openly do it. It's a screw you frame. And it's exactly what parents get who are constantly giving their kids the blame finger. But anyway, all right. Now, now these are three variations of power in pairing that I was just talking about. This one here, I am the one who can tell you that you are OK. And of course, you have to accept that. Unless he tells you that you're OK, you're not OK. How many of you know people who say, well, if there's nobody around to tell me I'm OK, I'm probably not OK? Every therapist has gotten this all the time. We call that excessive dependency. <coughs> we also call it some other names. <laughs> all right. Now over here, um, how, does the, how, does the, uh, how does this get translated that you are to worship her? Well, if this is a religious figure, which she isn't, uh, but it feels like she is, you're beholden in some way. That here is, the message is that what you do between people <coughs> is you distance yourself from them by doing worshipful things. Huh? Okay. Now, over here, the message is, I have the right to tell you how bad you are and what's wrong with you. Now, I wonder if you can see that all three of these things are part of the same picture. If I can tell you how bad you are, I can tell you how good you are. If I can tell you how bad you are and how good you are, then I am somebody who is always right and, as a result, wish to be worshipped. They all fit together. Now, the other part of this is, is in some way, there is, a, there is an expectation and an acceptance that this is the right way to be. So you do your proper worshiping. You do your proper uh, looking for his approval. And you do, you do the acceptance that he's probably, even though you hate what he's doing, you have to endure it. All of these are erosions against the growth of both people. The growth of both people. The loneliness in terms of these people right here, because they can't make any connection with people there. The fears that are down here, because this is almost all fear dominated, down here. I do this because I'm afraid. I can't do anything else. How many times have you heard someone who, when the women who get bashed by their husbands, and what do they tell you? They say, I couldn't make it out there. How many of you have worked with, with women that have been battered? How many of you worked with men that have been battered? Yeah, they get the, it's the same thing, you know. If you feel that I have to stand this no matter what, I mean, then it doesn't matter, man or woman, because that's the victim idea. We are shot through with victimizations. We are shot through with the fact that we of ourselves could do nothing. Somebody else has to do it for us. So you can see, at least for me, one of the things I'm going to do is to get everybody up on their feet. 
not by getting one to stop doing something to the other one. Because all I'm doing then is turning it around. And I'm not doing anything. When I get you to stop beating her, I haven't done anything for her. Because all you've done is withdrawn your piece of behavior. Doesn't say anything about what she can do. So a lot of times people work at problems to get people to stop doing something to somebody else and that that's the primary focus. has never been with me. What is is that we can deal with each person in terms of this. All right. Now, <clears throat> as we look at this, I want to show you now some other facets of this. To the outside world, worshiping one person by another, uh, for many people, is a positive thing. I hear people tell me about their marital relationships that they just worship each other. Of course, when I get to know them better, I find out what their secret life is all about. This is inhuman. Worshipful of one human being to another is inhuman. We're uh, having some uh, as an adult, to have somebody else tell you how good you are and you depend upon that is continuing your life as a helpless child. And you cannot stand on your own feet. The minute that he goes away, she has to fall on her face. I remember people, women who, they, they would get some kind of sickness or something like that, and their husbands had to stay home with them, a hysterical reaction, because if they, the husbands left, the threat was that they would die. I don't know if any of you ever got into those. And I soon learned that what I needed to do is break that blackmail. But both of them were in it. It's like co-alcoholism and the alcoholic. All right. Now, the other thing is that for you, if the bond is this way, that you always have to take care of her and be there, then when you go away, you have to fear that she, something terrible is going to happen. So you can't even really be yourself wherever you go. And one of the things is it wouldn't it be nice for you to get drunk, to take drugs, to get something to make your consciousness forget about your burdens? You know how many people leave home every year? Adults they never heard again, heard of again? They had it. Now let's look over here, the mean one. Mean one. Same identical thing. At a certain point, you will behave as though that you're doing what he wants you to do, and at a certain point, you will act out somewhere. You can't avoid it. You'll act out with your, with your peers or with your parents. Still, about 80% uh, of all murders committed in this country are committed on families. Husbands killing wives, wives killing husbands, and parents or children, and this kind of stuff. Those statistics have run pretty much the same for many years now. And what it says to me is that it's dangerous to not be able to stand on your own feet. So, at some point, you're going to break out of that. Now, would you reverse the positions? And those who were down be up now. <coughs> now I want you to notice something. For you, for you to feel that you could be, you, that you could get into a spot where he was, he is now your old father. And you are now a man, and you're giving him his what force? All our, uh, many of our problems with older people and what happens to their children just reflects what's been going on. That's all. Now, here at this point in time, let us say this is a marital situation, and he has become ill. And you got some good chances there. Damn. That's right. <laughs> and you can smother him. That's right. You can smother him, which is what people do. So whatever he could do for himself, you wouldn't let him do because you have to do everything for him. <clears throat> All right, and the morning he woke up and shot himself because he couldn't stand it anymore. The, yeah, the question would be, when I did everything for him, how could he behave this way? Perhaps one of the things that for me is so dear and so important is that all human beings are wanting a way to stand on their own feet and express themselves. And I, I used to think that people would love to be taken care of. It's true only to a degree. Only to a degree. 
Now over here, that worshipful business with you, at a certain point in time, you really never got anything from her. But this is what you learned. So you don't have any way to reach out from anybody or to get anything. But you stand in the background and do all your worshipful things. So here you are. Now, if you can drop dead, please. <laughs> That's very good. And you probably will, too. Okay. Go ahead, just down. And at this point in time, you do it, OK? All right, now, all these people will tell you they did the best they can, and that's true. They did absolutely the best they could. But this is all based upon the hierarchical model where we're never equal to each other. All right, now what I'd like you to do is come back to the position you were, please. This is a great place to come back from. <coughs> Just stay where you are, right down. Stay, no, stay where you are, down like that, okay. down. No, no, not down, not you. I, I'm sorry. Here, you just stay at her feet. Here, it doesn't really matter. And you, one of you down, one of you down. <clears throat> All right. I can tell you without exception, with the thousands of people I have seen, and there were these troubles where people were having whatever they're having, I never found a relationship of equality that existed. Not once. Didn't mean I didn't find good people. That wasn't a point. But the way in which they handled their pairing, I never found it. All right, now, pardon me? Oh, pair. I could hear. Pairing, yeah. I never found it. Never found it. I was able to help it grow afterward, but I never found it. All right, now, what can you do? What can anybody do when their relationships with people are based upon this kind of thing? You have to go into manipulation and strategies. You have to go into secrets. You have to go into lies. And you have to go into loneliness, because what can you connect with? You have to fill your life with activity, because there's nothing else to do. All right. Now, I'd like to have you as in your positions that you are because people still try to go close. I want you to just go to walk toward each other in your position right now. Just walk toward each other. Walk and try to, try to walk. All right, now what's happening for you? All he does is wants to go close. Wanna you want to push him away. <laughs> Marvelous. <laughs> you want to push him away and he wants to go close. <laughs> That's bound to create a crisis. All right. Now, what do you feel about what she's doing? I feel like she's trying to push me away. She's trying to push you away, and how do you feel about that? Smart. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. No, but in this family, we are close. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, what happened over here when you started to go together? Turning to the side. You were turning to the side. All right, let's see what happens as you do that. Turn to the side and keep on going. And you go on that way. That's right. OK. The minute that you got a chance, all right? All right? So now, over here, what's happening? I'm going under the chair. You what? I'm going under the chair. You're going under the chair. There is a crisis over here, too. All right. <laughs> Every one of these, these three, show the intent to be close, the wish to be close. But he is running away. And he is feeling pushed away, and they are leaving each other. So one of the things then you hear so often, I tried to get close, but it didn't work. And of course it doesn't work in these positions. It cannot work. Now, let's create the condition in which it can work. I'd like all of you now to take up your position very tight, what you have right now. Back off a little bit. Take it very tight, all right? Now I'd like you to put in your hand a wishing stick, in your mind, a wishing stick, which gives you the power to come to your own feet, standing on your own feet, relaxed and free to move. And when you feel yourself on your own feet and free to move, <laughs> so
Some of us, and without meaning to, get so familiar with where we are that it doesn't occur to us that we're having problems in ourselves. All right, now, feel yourself free to move, both of you. Free to move, all everything, move. Move, your arms move, your hands move. Now look at each other and see what you want to do with each other now and do it. <laughs> all right, now I want to show you something. <coughs> This happens. I didn't tell anybody what to do. What do you want to do now? You want to make a contact. Now you can have closeness, but you can't have it in the other way without a lot of difficulty, and then it doesn't turn out that way. What do you suppose made it possible for you to move toward the embrace when you were on your own feet? It's basically a sense of freedom. All right, basically a sense of freedom. Let me get this. A freedom that you didn't have while you were busy taking care, having to give, be everything to her, mm -hmm. because you couldn't feel free to love. How many of you have noticed how so many times when people feel so bound by duty and guilt that they hate the people they're with? How many of you noticed that? Now, do you see how ridiculous it is to work on those feelings until you change the nature for each person about their being able to stand on their own feet? And sometimes this is hard. Now, what enabled you to make the embrace? You want to take this, love? Okay. I didn't feel held down. I didn't feel held down. Now, when, you know, there was, a, in the 60s, there was something that began to something like this. Well, it's your problem. Did you ever hear that? Now, in a way, that's true. But let us take, take our young lady here, Doreen. Doreen was following, when she was down on her knees, following what she thought was expected of her. She didn't even know that she was held down until she stood up. She didn't know it. It's like so many people have an awareness about something different once they get to it. Otherwise, they accept it as something is the way it should be. Now she has a feeling that she, that she probably didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And in that natural feeling of standing on your own feet, these shoulders want to go that way. I have yet to see that fail. When I watch and work with families and get them on their feet, being able, and what that means is that they can say what they feel and think, and they can make decisions for themselves, they can share. Their arms want to move this way, which is fantastic. What made it for you? I noticed you had a long little while to get to one another here, because a lot of the feelings, I imagine, of the worship thing had become covered up. What happened for you? Let me have that thing. I felt more, I felt more equal. You felt more equal. Right, and more confident. And more confident. To be accepted. To, to be accepted. Now, what is interesting, and in, let's see. Dahlia. Dahlia. Dahlia said, by getting herself to her feet, not, let, you're not doing it because you let her, but you got on your own feet, you said, I could feel more confident. I wonder how many of you here have ever heard of people who try to make one person confident by getting the other person to change. Doesn't work. All right. And now what about you? And you are? Madeline. Madeline. The movement freed me. I felt, it felt like dancing then because I felt there was the room to move in and out. There was that sense of movement, whereas in the other positions it felt static, that I had to stand in one place. And how many of you have encountered that? You know, when we start introducing movement into our work, just like this, like uh, Madeline said, she begins to feel her life and begins to feel confidence out of that. Mm. All right, let's see what happened over here. How did you, well, what did you do? Uh, I could see his face. You and, could see uh, his face. And see his response to me, and I like that. Okay, now what did you do when you both got on your own feet? I wanted to dance with him. You danced, you wanted to dance with him, all right. Did you do it? Okay, did you notice how willing he was? You really didn't have to make contracts, you really didn't have to do anything. The life will want to respond when we get in a position to do it. 
How many of you know that actually for sure? Let me see your hands. You know that. When we're in a position to respond, we just do. All right, what happened for you, Peter? Um, when I was, uh, I think I started out on top, and he looked real disgusting when I was on top. And when I was on the bottom, he looked real threatening. But when we were on the same level, he just seemed like a nice Listen, guy. Listen, say that again, Peter, and louder. When I was on the top, he looked like a sort of worm, you know, n not very good at all, disgusting. Now, hold it just a minute. How many times have you heard that somebody that is on the top looking down who's on the bottom? You know, when, and I have worked down a communication stance for that, it's called placating. And a lot of people want to kick in the teeth, the placator. Have you noticed that? <laughs> There's an aggression that comes. Don't grovel in front of me, even though I tell you you should. Because there's something repugnant to the human being. Now, what did you say about the next one? Well, then when we, when we changed places, he seemed real dangerous and violent and, and threatening. And so I just, I didn't want to be around him Think about that for a minute. I'm little and I'm looking up. How many times has the person who has in, been in the victim status told you about their fear? And how everything looks menacing. In my practice, I keep chairs where people can stand up on top of them and look down. That will always help a lot. So then you could. Well, at the end, of course, he was moving real relaxedly, and I liked his face, and he seemed like a good human being. Now, in those contexts that we have established here, now to deal with any kind of problem, you have the energy creative energy from both people from their feet. <coughs> this is one of the reasons why I work on all of this. OK, now, what do you want to have happen? What do you want to accomplish? Well, I would like to get my kid to do the dishes at night. I say, OK, let's take a look at how that can happen. But now we're doing it within goodwill and people on their feet. And this is what I am trying to establish. The last part of this that you just saw with people getting to their own feet is not what happens unless people get a very special learning. They try instead to do the best that they can do, keeping things to themselves and trying to be either um, some form of bossy or dependent or something of that sort. And it's amazing how people change. I no longer believe that we can talk about people as dependent or independent. We can talk about them as what they have learned about how to be in this world. So I no longer think that way. Because people are just doing what they have been taught. Now I'd like to ask you all something and we'll break for lunch. What was this like for you? Where is our little thing? Oh, you got it. Let me start over here. Why don't we start with you, Peter? What was this like for you, Peter? to have put your body and your mind and your attention in this part of the exercise. I think I was a little, a little scared to really enter into it because people think I was silly. Hold it one minute. Say it again. I, I think I was afraid to really enter into it because I thought people out there would think I was silly. All right. Now, you hear Peter talking in past tense. Did you hear that? You all hear that? He's talking past tense. That's where you were. Where are you now? It didn't seem so bad now that it's over. <laughs> it didn't seem so bad, all right? Did it in any way seem good? Yeah, I, I, I like the fact that Lynn was uh, not so scared of male, male stuff that we could touch at the end. That now, was you see what a long journey he made in a very short time? You will not have this same kind of thing like this again, where you're going to be so scared that they'll think you're foolish. All right, Glenn, what happened for you? Well, I was started out afraid I was trying to be a show-off, and then I now feel real good. Uh, it's okay to be a show-off. <laughs> All right. When you are working with people, see, what we have here, and it's interesting, what we have here are just what, what people think. 
When I first introduced to somebody the idea that we can do some posturing, we can do some sculpting, I know that underneath they're going to be feeling what their mamas told them, that you shouldn't do things that people might be critical of. And so I know that. But I can encourage them to do it. And I don't spend much time on that. I just ask them, will you do it? <laughs> and then later we talk about what happened. Because there's no way I can help anybody to know something they haven't yet done. So I use the power of the possibility of change and my own, my own um, way of connecting with people to say it's OK. We can do that. Then how does it, how, what happens? You can do that. All right. <clears throat> he said, uh, uh, Peter said that people would think I was silly. And Glenn says, well, I might be a show off. And everybody knows that your mother said you shouldn't show off. But all that both of those are talking about is this is something new they haven't done before. And how is it, how is it for you, Craig? Well, first of all, when I got up here, I felt comfortable. And then when Doreen got down to her knees, I felt extremely uncomfortable. And then when we reversed our roles, when I got on my knees, I felt comfortable because I felt things had been balanced out. And then when I was instructed to stand up, I felt uncomfortable doing that. And I can't really explain why, but I just, I just didn't feel it was time yet to come up. Should stay there a little longer for penance. But it was odd, <laughs> I guess. No, th this is huh? not an unusual yeah. statement. This is not an unusual statement. I yet do not have the permission. Right. I haven't suffered enough right. for it. I didn't feel deserving. Deserving, that's yeah. a very important thing. And there are some people, you know, who felt so undeserving that they'll live their whole life, unless anybody interferes, feeling they've never really quite made it because somebody else has, has suffered more than they have. How do you feel now? Uh, I feel good. Marvelous. See, in each one of these, we get a, a slightly different picture of what's going on. But it's all relating to the same thing. Yes. I feel really good because it's the first time I've ever allowed myself to volunteer and come up and do it. And it's something that I wanted to, to do during these times. So I feel really good that Isn't I did it. that nice? <laughs> now, again, how many of you could be, could be where uh, Doreen is thinking, hey, I wanted to do something and I did it and isn't it great? How many can identify with that? All right, think about the good feelings that you have that people can have. Like if you're working with a family or with a person, they want to do something. And the degree to which you can help them do it will make them feel better. These are all ways of strengthening the self, yes. Would you use the same strategies and techniques for resistance? Sure. All, remember, all that resistance is. There's a question about resistance. Resistance is my word about you not doing what I want you to do. <laughs> and resistance is very important, but we need to read it properly. Now, what happened for you? Okay, when I came in, I, uh, I was very, very curious to, to see what will happen. Um, I've been before in front, so I didn't have any problem with this. Um, one thing that really struck me, how uncomfortable I was when Madeleine was down on her knees and looked up at me and I, I just felt distant and, and was very, and, and really led me to think about many things in my life, what position I really like to be. And, and the last thing I'd like to mention is that I was very happy I done it because I was sitting next to Madeleine and never had any contact. I think I really didn't perceive her. Well, now after this exercise, definitely I perceive her and I got contact with her. Good. Okay. And what about you? Madeline. Madeline, that's right. Well, when I was down on my knees, I was surprised to find what a comfortable, safe place it was for me. Because I really thought I'd worked through a lot of that, you know, but it was, it was so good to be down there. And I felt much more powerful when I was down there than when I was standing up and Dahlia was down there. Because when, when she was on her knees, um, I felt very, like there was way too much space around and, and the isolation and the loneliness of standing up. And when we were both standing up, it felt, I felt much more contact with her. We could really make eye contact and, and I felt the intimacy and I felt a mixture of feelings about it, that it was really inviting on the one hand, but also 
uh, a little frightening to be so close in terms of, you know, if, if I wanted to dance, and as you said, what do you want to do with each other? And if I wanted to dance in a certain way, would she also? Uh -huh. it, it was um, more exciting, but also more frightening in a way than either of that the other positions. That would be all positions. new stuff for you to discover, all that. Marvelous. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know, it, does it, did it strike you as odd that Madeline said when I was down there in the placating, I felt safe? See, the question often is, what do you pay for safety? Well, what she does is gets a highly developed skill and, and information about what's on the floor, but not much <laughs> else. And you don't have very far to fall. And so a lot of people, that's how they, that's, that's where it is with them. And they don't know that it can be some other way. 